sanctuary just choose a, a topic that we all want to hear about and um, and quite honestly and pastorally a topic that I know concerns many of us. Um, there are those in this room who in their families have been affected by the gun violence in our nation and there are those in this room who have called me or pulled me aside after or before a meeting um, ever since 2012, I'd say, and I started here in 2011, to say, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. And I keep watching the horrific images on the TV and I am in despair. And so with the mission committee, which I'm so grateful for the mission committee that is so hospitable and open to such conversations, <coughs> Um, we have decided to have this conversation in response to that pastoral concern. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read to you not the entire, um, uh, Presbyterians can be long-winded. It's like 10 pages front and back what the 225th General Assembly <laughs> has uh, put out regarding gun violence. But it also means that Presbyterians are very thoughtful and do everything um, uh, by a scriptural warrant. So I'm just going to read the first affirmation and just the preamble to the recommendations and then the first recommendation. And just to tell you, there are about 12. So I'm going to read you the first. Um, and I will have this document of the, you know, what was um, voted upon um, at the General Assembly. I'll have this uh, document available here in the church. This is what it says. We remember that the disciples asked Jesus when he saw them in faithful ministry, and he answered, oh, when they asked when he saw them in faithful ministry, and he answered, as you did it to the one of the least of these, you did it for me, Matthew 25, 40. In our country, 40,000 people are losing, losing their lives each year to gun violence. Each one of these represents to us the crucified Christ, as do their orphans, their grieving parents and families, as do the nearly 100,000 who are injured and the countless others who are traumatized by gun violence through suicides, murders, family violence, and accidents. In faithfulness to the Prince of Peace, the Presbyterian Church USA stands with, grieves with, and calls for change alongside the victims of our uniquely American epidemic of gun violence. And here's the preamble to the recommendations. As the Presbyterian Church USA marks 10 years since the adoption of gun violence gospel values mobilizing in response to God's call, the epidemic of gun violence has continued unabated and, in fact, has intensified and worsened. It is time for the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church USA, to reaffirm and strengthen its commitment to be an active and prophetic leader in the national movement to end gun violence. To this end, the 225th General Assembly in 2022 of the Presbyterian Church USA approves the following recommendations. And this is the first recommendation that has called us, the Mission Committee and I, um, to have this conversation to renew its commitment to end gun violence by approving a 10-year campaign, the Decade to End Gun Violence 2022 to 2032, to be conducted at all levels of the church. So um, I wanted to um, let you know that we aren't the only Presbyterian church having this conversation, and um, I am specifically naming this a conversation about gun violence which I don't think can be debated if there is gun violence in our nation. That's not a debate. I'm not using words like control or rights after the word gun on purpose because we are speaking about gun violence and we are um, answering a call um, from the Presbyterian Church USA. I thank you all for being here and for your compassion for all in the room um, for whom this may be a difficult conversation. And I thank Randy Powell's um, he's 
a really good uh, member of the church. And I called him about a month and a half ago and said, can we have a conversation about a possible teaching opportunity? And here he is, our speaker um, for um, the third Sunday conversation about gun violence. Randy came to me after reading the, um, the entire issue of uh, the Presbyterian Outlook, which I will have copies for that, of that for everyone, and came to me and said, I'd love to have this conversation and speak to it from a scientist's point of view. And I thought, okay, all right, that'll kind of open up the conversation. And so Randy, I'm very grateful. Um, I talk about third rail conversations, you know, third, the third rail um, in the railroad is the one that's electrified, right? And Randy, you're willing to speak to a third rail conversation that by the those are intendants um, is an important one too. So thank you, Randy. I would like to begin with prayer before Randy speaks. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God. We thank you that with an entire denomination, we here in this congregation begin this conversation regarding the violence and the grief in our nation. We thank you for leaders like Randy and others who have made a space and information available Thank you for the hospitality of the mission committee. And we ask that you bless our conversation and our time together as we consider our way of living into the Matthew 25 movement and our way of being faithful to you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. The red switch. Here I was thinking that I was being amplified. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Erica. There we go. Um, okay. Um, probably everybody has this handout by now. And um, I'm going to talk about a few statistics first. And one of them is right on the back page. Um, and this, to me, this graph is one of the best I've seen. It makes the problem fairly obvious. On the y-axis, on the vertical axis of this graph, are the gun homicides per 100,000 people. So it's a per capita, per capita measure. And on the x-axis, across the horizontal, are the number of guns per 100 people. This is for developed countries. And you can see we've got this cluster of developed countries down at the bottom left. Canada, Portugal, Germany, France, Belgium, Spain, Spain and Austria all have very low numbers of guns per 100 people in their countries and very low numbers of gun homicides per, uh, you know, per capita in their countries. And the US is out there way at the upper right. Um, it's, it's a graph that sort of speaks volumes all by itself. Who took this out? This one I don't remember. Sorry, Barry. Um, you can find things like this um, pretty readily by just doing searches. You have to be a little careful because there's misinformation out there as well. Um, but a, a couple of other statistics that I picked up from some reliable places. Um, gun deaths for people less than 18 years of age in the U.S. have more than doubled since 2011. And they've gone up about 50% just from 2019 to 2021. Um, people wonder what can be done about this um, and 
what kind of issues there, there are what, uh, that we can sort of help the situation. One of them would be universal background checks. Um, right now, anybody who buys a gun from a federally licensed gun dealer must submit to a background check. However, if you buy it privately, there's no requirement for background check. Um, and a lot of those sales happen at gun shows. They, that's why people call it the gun show exception, but that's not quite true. It's a private exchange exception. Um, but those things, only, so that the, the federally licensed dealers only cover about 75% of gun sales. That figure is hard to pin down exactly because private sales are private sales. Nobody, they're not tracked. But, um, and so those, you'll see different numbers given, but the, the main one and in the middle is about 75% of gun sales are tracked, but 25% are not. So they are not subject to background checks. Um, interestingly enough, when you read statistics about this, um, and, and I'm not going to be political here, but a lot of these statistics are given as, well, so many percent of Democrats think and so many percent of Republicans think. Um, but this universal background check is supported by 80% of people who call themselves Republicans and over 90% of people who call themselves Democrats. So it's, there's a very large ground swell, swell of support for this, yet it doesn't get done. Um, stricter red flag laws are, are uh, red flag laws are laws that say, you know, if you have um, committed a felony, for example, or other things, um, they're, they're different in different states, but certain people are not allowed to purchase guns if they fulfill one of these red flag conditions. Um, there's, there's a big push for stricter red flag laws. Uh, requiring a permit for open and concealed carry. Uh, this is a big, and, and what's happening out there with states is more and more states are saying, Indiana is not one of them, you can cons uh, carry a weapon open or concealed and th there's no permit required. Okay? You can just strap your pistol on any day you want and, and go out shopping. Uh, again, um, requiring permits for open and concealed carry, an overwhelming number of people uh, support that. Over 60% of Republicans and over 80% of Democrats, people who call themselves Republicans or Democrats, support that. Yet, it doesn't get done. We're going in the opposite direction, generally. Um, one other issue uh, that, that comes up is, is smart guns. This is a rather new one, um, and it's, I don't have any statistics on this, but there are guns, there are ways to manufacture guns now where only the person that is authorized can actually fire that gun. Maybe they'll have a ring on that, that identifies, it's sort of like your car, right, with your, key, with your keys and your key fob. They'll have something on, uh, on the gun and on the person who can fire it, and if they're not close to it, it can't, it can't be fired. So those are a few of the, um, the issues that are out there about getting more control of guns. Um, what I'm going to focus on here for a little bit more time is the one that the printed part of the handout talks about. And that is assault weapons. Um, we used to have a ban in this country on, on uh, private individuals owning these kinds of guns. That was done away with in the 90s. And uh, now you can. Um, and one of the reasons that I got um, 
and, and made this handout, in, in fact, did that a long time ago, is that my sister-in-law was running for city council in Dyer. And you think, well, what does the city council have to do with gun laws? Gun laws should be state or federal. Somehow this issue kept coming up at the uh, events she would attend. And um, people would, would tell her, no, you know, my pistol that I have is just as effective at killing people as an assault rifle. And that is egregiously false, but it, it's an issue that comes up over and over and over again. In fact, in this magazine, which Pastor Erica talked about, this is the Presbyterian Outlook, the gun issue, it, it, which is very good. I'd recommend you reading it. Uh, one of the authors just talks to people in various, at various Presbyterian churches, and he's got their quotes in here. And here's one of them. Um, this, again, this is not the author of the article. This is somebody he was interviewing from a Presbyterian church uh, whose last name was Fox. And here's the quote. Fox says he supports the idea of background checks and waiting periods to buy guns, but he doesn't understand the emphasis in the public debate on banning semi-automatic rifles. A gun is a gun is a gun, he said. They all shoot bullets. You can do as much damage with a gun with seven bullets in it as with an assault rifle. Um, as I said before, that, that statement is egregiously false, and we're going to talk about why that is. Um, and to do that, we have to get into a few little technical things here. Okay, so we're on the on the written part of this now. Um, so up there at, at the top, we're, I'm not going to go through every word of this, um, but for those of you who don't know some of these terms, the guns come in different what they call calibers and. Um, they, you, you hear talk about guns like a nine millimeter or a 38 special. That's the caliber, and all the caliber is really is basically the diameter of the bullet. Um, there's some fudging on that a little bit, but basically it's the diameter of the bullet. The term semi automatic, what does that mean? It means that. Um, the weapon can be fired as fast as you can pull the trigger, okay? That's semi-automatic. Fully automatic would be a machine gun where you just pull the trigger, hold it down, and it keeps firing as fast as it can. Um, an assault rifle is a, a little bit of a fuzzy definition, but what it means is a rifle that is um, at least semi-automatic and can hold a high capacity magazine. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a, in a couple of minutes, but that, that's what constitutes an assault, an assault rifle. People talk about AR-15s, you've heard that term a lot. Um, that's one of the most popular in this country, um, but it also applies to other kinds of rifles like AK-47s and a number of others. Assault rifles are deadly for three basic reasons. Um, the energy of the bullet, the accuracy that they can fire them at, and the capacity for, the high capacity for ammunition. Um, they have far more energy than a handgun. Um, they are immensely more accurate than a handgun. And the ammo capacities are a lot higher. So they can put more energetic bullets on a target far more accurately and keep on doing that for a lot longer than a handgun. And that, those are the, the principal reasons that they are more deadly. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, bullet energy, I'm going to put up an equation. So. Nobody faint. 
E here is energy. That symbol means proportional to, okay? And M is mass, V is velocity. So the energy of anything that's moving, the kinetic energy, is proportional to its mass times its velocity squared. Okay, that's, that is a really important thing to understand about ballistics. It's not just mass times velocity. That's a different number called momentum. Mass times velocity squares the energy. And this is one of the reasons that, for instance, a stopping distance on a car gets so much longer as you speed up. Your car doesn't have twice as much energy when it's going 60 miles an hour than when it's going 30. It has four times as much energy, okay? You double the velocity, you will increase the energy by a factor of four. And so when you put on your brakes, you, you have to take out a factor of four times, and the stopping distance is gonna be much longer than twice your stopping distance at 30. It's probably gonna be about four times. Um, the um, Comparing, for instance, a, a pistol to one of these assault rifles, a typical assault rifle uh, has a bullet that exits the barrel at about 3,200 feet per second. Um, a, a typical 9 millimeter handgun has a bullet that exits the barrel at about 1,200 feet per second. Okay? That's a huge difference. And um, if you if you figure the mass in there, okay, the mass, most of these um, assault rifles have small caliber bullets. They're small diameter. They're not very massive. And so they can be launched to a very high velocity, and that's where they pick up the energy from. Um, but typically, uh, a, a an AR-15 that's firing a 55 grain bullet at 3,200 feet per second delivers 3.4 times as much energy as a nine millimeter handgun, okay? And that's one of the big um, issues and one of the big reasons why they are so much more deadly. When a bullet that's going that fast hits a human body, the human body will react more, unless it hits a bone directly, it reacts a little bit more like a liquid than a solid. And it does what's called, a, it, it sends a tremendous shock wave into the body when it hits. And it does what's called cavitation. It opens up a cavity as it enters the body, that's about 12 times the diameter of the bullet. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, it's a little bullet. It'll just kind of punch a little hole in me and go and come out the other side. That's not the case. The, um, so with a, an AR-15, it's a small bullet, 0.22. It's, a, it's essentially a 22. Multiply that by 12, which is the, the size of the cavity, and you get over two and a half inches. Um, doctors who treat people who have been shot with these weapons say that the damage to the body it, uh, organs is just massive because this of this high energy high velocity bullet uh, that's going through you okay um, accuracy um, there's I have a a lot of things written down there about accuracy, um, which I'm not gonna go through all the details, but uh, a longer barrel on a rifle than, than on a pistol, okay, um, is inherently more accurate as you point it. The steadying effect of the stock 
placed against the shoulder. When you're shooting a pistol, you're either holding it with one hand or maybe holding it with two out at the end of your arms. Okay? When you're shooting a rifle, you, you're holding on with both hands and you've got it against your shoulder. Um, so that steadying effect is actually kind of a big deal. Um, the recoil um, of a bullet is proportional to its momentum, not its velocity. Okay, so that's energy. Re recoil is proportional to mass times velocity. So when you increase the speed of the bullet a lot, you get a ton more energy, but you own, but not that much more momentum. Okay, the momentum of um, an AR-15 bullet is only about. Let me get my figure here. It's only about 28 percent more than the momentum of a pistol. So you've got much more steadying effect, okay, with the stock against your shoulder and only 28% more momentum than you would when you fire a pistol. So you can hold that weapon much steadier, even though you're delivering a lot more energy to the target. Um, and of course, the higher bullet velocity, it shoots what they call, shoots flatter. Anything, even when you shoot a bullet, <laughs> It, it drops with gravity just like everything else drops, okay? People think, oh no, it's, it's flying, it's kind of like a plane. Oh, it doesn't have wings. It drops with gravity just like everything else. And when it's going so much faster, it will drop a lot less, so there's less that you have to take into account when you're aiming. So all of these accuracy issues all add together to a huge increase in accuracy firing um, an assault rifle than firing a pistol, for example. Um, the, I, I looked this up in some of the um, shooting sites, uh, map shooting, target shooting sites that I found. Um, and they say that a good handgun shooter can hit a standard target about 90% of the time at 50 yards, and a master shooter can do that, uh, hit that target 90% of the time at about 100 yards with, with a handgun. However, with an AR-15, those numbers go from 50 and 100 yards to 300 and 600 yards, respectively. So we're saying that you can shoot it six, uh, six times farther as accurately with an AR-15 as you can with a handgun. And of course, when you start to sweep out area now, if you sweep out a circle of six times the radius of another circle, that's 36 times the area that you can cover with an AR-15 or other assault rifle than you can cover with a handgun. Um, ammo capacity, the largest practical thing you can get in a handgun is about 16 shots. Uh, many of them are smaller, but that's about the best you can do. Um, AR-15s, you can get 30, 40, or 100 round magazines. Um, so, uh, and when you think about it too, you're, you're holding that pistol out in front of you like this, and it's it's heavy, it's unsteady, um, so it's harder as you put more and more bullets in that thing. It gets heavier, gets harder to hold. With the rifle, you've got both arms and your body backing it up. Um, I think it, um, at the top of my second page, I've got a thing called deadly example case. Um, and that's one that almost all of us are familiar with, the Las Vegas shooting at the Mandalay Bay Hotel uh, is a very grim but very good example of the power of an assault rifle, an AR-15. 
The shooter was on the 32nd floor of the hotel. The festival audience was 490 yards away. That's over a quarter of a mile. He fired about 1,100 shots into the festival audience over a period of about 10 minutes. Killed 58 and wounded 422 people. Now those are not people that got hurt in, this, in the rush to get out. Those are people that got hit by bullets, okay? 58 dead, 422 wounded. This uh, shooter was using 100 round magazines. Um, this, um, this massacre would have been completely impossible with a handgun, okay? You needed that high capacity um, and greater energy and greater reach of, of the assault rifle. Um, 490 yards is a stretch for even an, uh, an assault rifle. However, uh, the shooter managed to hit people with about half of the shots that were fired from 490 yards away. Um, a couple of last red herrings to deal with. A, a lot of people will say the AR-15 is just a hunting rifle like other rifles. Okay. That's extremely misleading. Yes, could you go and kill a deer with an AR-15? Yes, sure could. But most real hunters use bolt action rifles for hunting. I don't know if you, you probably, if you don't know what that is, it, to get the next bullet into a bolt action rifle, you have to grab it, flip it up, pull it back, push it back in, and flip it down again. Yeah. Um, you got to be quick. They're very, the hunters use those because they're very simple, they're very reliable, they're less expensive, and some people claim they're a little bit more accurate because of the, the solid um, bolt that's behind the bullet when it fires. Um, and usually these rifles have magazines of only between six and 10 shots. And when you're hunting anyway, if you're gonna shoot at a deer, and you miss it, your opportunities are probably gone. So, you, yeah, you could kill a deer with an AR-15, but they are not, it's sort of ridiculous to use it for hunting. Um, another one that came up with my sister-in-law a lot was that people who said my 357 or 44 Magnum handgun is as deadly as an AR-15 and nobody is complaining about them. Um, I don't know if you, if, for those of you who haven't heard those terms before, 357 and 44 Magnum, Magnums have been around for a long time, they're handguns, um, and they're very, very powerful. Magnums mean they, they have a much bigger load of powder than a typical gun has. Um, and again, there you have the, you have the, a big bullet, it still doesn't have as much energy as an AR-15. It's still only maybe a half or two thirds as much as an AR-15. So the, the energy is still lower. Plus now you have to deal with a horrendous amount of recoil. Um, I don't own a gun, but I shot a 357 Magnum, trust me. <laughs> it takes you a while to recover from just one shot and get the thing back on the target. So yes, if you're gonna go um, shoot somebody, shoot one or two people with, with a Magnum, that's gonna be very deadly. But, uh, you know, um, AR-15s really only have one purpose and that is to kill as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, and that is all I have. Um, 
Any questions? Well, Randy, where do we go from here? I mean, if the Presbyterian Church has said that we should consider discussion about hand or about uh, the violence uh, from the guns, where shall we go? It's a good question. Um, in my mind, there, <coughs> excuse me. There are people who will say that you need to push to um, either to replace the Second Amendment with something that's more clear. Second Amendment was written when the most powerful guns around were things that you had to load by stuffing things down the barrel, okay? Um, and it's a thought, but it's a long shot, right? Because you have to do so much. You have to get so many states. You have to get, up, well, first you gotta get Congress, then you have to get states to back that up. And it's a lengthy procedure, which is gonna be very difficult to do. I think some of those other things we talked about, uh, universal background checks, um, getting assault weapons re-banned, that's going to be hard, but uh, again, if you look at the statistics, um, and I, I didn't bring one of those, but you can find stuff online that'll show you that gun deaths started to, you know, they were on a certain trajectory, and then when the, the ban was lifted, psh, that trajectory went up with time, more and more people getting killed. Um, so, I think it's, yeah. No, I was gonna that. say, cause I used to work for the police department in Chicago, and we used to, and we encouraged those that, who don't have their guns registered, like you said, you, they don't have to, you can buy them from like a private owner. We encourage them to get them um, registered, get that permit. Because like you said, it could be used for a murder or anything, or somebody may just give it, could just mean I like, commit a crime, and then turn around and sell it to you. And then if you turn it in, then it's gonna fall on you. So they encourage that, but then yeah. we found out that a lot of people were scared to turn in those guns. So they had a, like a turn, a gun turn in thing where you could just turn them in and the police won't ask no questions. And they'll, yeah. you know, check them guns to make sure that it wasn't used for no, you know, crime or anything. Yeah, yeah. And then you could, uh, they'll give you a gift card or something for it. It's a good point. Um, and that was one of the things that they, cause I don't know if they still do it or not, because I haven't been over there in a while. But yeah, we, they used to do it all the time, a, a gun turn back then. I know Father Flager used to have them all the time. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Michigan City has a gun turned like that. Because in the police station, you can see all the guns that have been turned in when you sit there in the lobby. Yeah. Another law to push hard on, I think, is, is, is the uh, open and concealed carry, requiring a permit. Uh, that used to be true in lots of places. You had to have, it was true in Indiana. You had to have a permit. And now we're, again, that's supported by a majority, a big majority of Americans and a majority of either political party, both of them. Why can't we get it done? So um, Indiana is open carry? Yes, and, and, or concealed, either one. <clears throat> and you don't need a permit. No, I was going to uh, respond to that too because I was just in a conversation with my son about that, my youngest son, because he wanted a gun. Because in Texas, they got open carry. And I told this fool, if you leave Texas and come to Illinois and they stop you and you don't have that permit, don't call me. Because <laughs> I'm not coming to get you. But he insists on, you know, I said, well, you might want to bring it with you when you come out of town. So it's good to have a permit. So I don't, you know, I haven't talked to him since then, but I know he don't have it now, but I've, you know, I've been talking with him about that. I think Antoinette brings up a really good point in answer to Janice's question is, you know, educating our children. 
last week when I made an announcement that, you know, to remind people of this conversation, um, immediately when I got into the confirmation room, one of the compromands said, well, pastor, what do you think? And we opened up a good conversation about this. Um, I, I will tell you that when my family attended Pride this summer, um, there was a protester walking the sidewalk with an AR, I always say the wrong thing. It was in an AK. Yeah, an AK. AK-47. AK thank, thank you, thank you. This is why I have Randy. Um, and if you don't know, there's a kids area during Pride with lots of games and toys and whatever. And we allowed our kids to be there and then just come and check in with us, our older kids, not Daisy. Long story short, um, the Pride folks decided not to engage this person because that would just incite more arguments. Um, the police were called. Our dear Mary Barr asked one of our um, council people, what are you gonna do about the man over there with the assault rifle? And the man said, and I knew he was doing it because he had to um, respond correctly politically. He said, I can't do anything. There's an open carry law in Indiana. On the way home, my son said to me, mom, do you know if that really was an AK-47 and it was really loaded, he would have taken out all of us in the kids area. Randy? Kids notice and it's good to have these conversations with our kids. Um, I did read most of that article from Outlook, and I'd like you to speak to the Oregon law that was passed. Do you remember that? No, but I can look it up. <laughs> there was a, a law in Oregon that was passed about the AK-47. And it was, they just, Oregon passed the law that you could not buy AK-47s at all anymore. It didn't mean that you couldn't have one that you already bought. So they were grandfathered in. They were grandfathered in. But you could not buy anymore. Or you could not trade them. Or you could not have them in gun shows. And I thought it was very interesting that Oregon is brave enough to do this. Yeah. I've had a mishap with, mishap with the, the copier. I apologize. I will have the entire issue if you want to get a copy of the entire issue and articles each on their own that are shorter. Um, I will have those available upstairs in the garden entrance in the Edith Boyd Lounge for you. We don't have them available today because I'm not great at <clears throat> copying. You know, the last thing I'd say, um, Janice, is to your question of what do we do now? Um, Here's the question, why there, there's these common sense things that are supported in the general population by people who identify with both parties, supported in good numbers. Why can't we get those done? Well, I mean, you're sort of only left with, with one place to go and that's to the legislatures or the Congress. And the, the people would like that stuff done, and their elected representatives are not doing it. And why is that? Well, I would suggest that you follow the money on that one. Um, but follow the money. Uh, but, but it is infuriating that we can't, we can't get those simple things done, which we think would do a lot of good. And, and people want to. Why yeah. is the National Rifle Association um, backing up an AK? I mean, surely you're supposed to get all of the money. She, she's, she's asking why does the National Rifle, Rifle Association back um, assault weapons and, and just about everything else. That's a, a kind of a sad story, uh, if you don't know, I mean, Years ago, decades ago, they used to be a much more conservative organization. They were concerned with gun safety. Uh, they, um, it was a much saner organization. And then, I, I don't remember when this was. I think it was in the, in the late 70s, possibly. But there was a big 
turmoil in the NRA and it got taken over by people with much more radical opinions and agendas. And that's, and that's where we've been ever since. Um, so they, they aren't what they used to be. Another thing, does the military let you take your weapon with you when you leave? Not that I, can, I, I can answer that okay. after 30 years in the military. <laughs> no, you cannot take your weapons with you. Uh, we trained on automatic weapons that Randy is describing. They were called uh, M16s, yeah. Very similar to the AR-15. But those weapons were designed for one thing, and that was to kill as many people as you can while you're in the military. And that's what we've got on the streets now. It, it, military weapons should never fall into the hands of people on the street. Never. The other thing that struck me in this article, in one of the articles, is that in some areas, they are, uh, if you are asked to turn in your weapons, and it's called guns to garden, and of course, mm. the word garden got my attention right away. And what they do is they set up a, um, like, out in our parking lot, you have a blacksmith or a gunsmith coming in, and they take the guns and they immediately cut them up, and they make things, ornaments for your garden, seeds for your garden. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, they do. We had this cut over. Rose, can I just uh, address the turn-in of these guns? These guns are junk. They're guns that have been in your grandfather's closet. They're not guns that are useful. Useful guns cost a whole lot of money. And those folks are not turning in these expensive handguns or especially these automatic rifles. It's just, if I got an old shotgun not in, somebody will give me a hundred bucks for it, I'll take it in and dump it. They're not getting the real deal. Yes, it's the optics on it are very good, right? It's a, it's a nice, it, people get together, they see it happening, it's outside and and you know it, it's kind of an encouraging thing to see, but you know how much does it really help? Is it is another question entirely? We um, just as an aside, uh, the kids at VBS we had pool noodles to use for making props, and so of course the first night they made swords, and there was a sword fight, and they really learned the choreography of sword fighting. It was kind of fun. The second night when they wanted to have a sword fight, I said, okay, but there needs to be a scene where they turn their swords into plowshares. Um, and they couldn't remember the word plowshares, so they started saying shovels, right? That was your line, wasn't it? And that's when um, I had told Brock and Barb about the program that Shane Claiborne has started. And I think it's more of a, as you said, the optics. It's more of, a, more of an advocacy and um, uh, awareness type of activity, but you're right, Walt, it's not getting um, some of these guns off the streets. But it's, it, but it's a good awareness activity. And that comes from scripture, by the way, swords and the plowshares. Just... <laughs> well, sometimes I fear that things that I say will be too controversial, and I want to remind you it's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thanks, Mary. I have a question. Are they actually uh, peaking handguns in 4-H? I don't know. Because a couple of years ago, up the street from me, there was a, a rum sale. And I had these old plastic containers. My husband used to be able to buy a, a tool, you know, power saw or something in it. And then, of course, it took around the nothing. So I wanted to get rid of some. I took them up there. I thought, well, this is something they want. And the lady said, oh, that's good. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Frightening, actually. I don't know. Um, when our children were in school, they went through a gun safety yeah. program. Do they still do that? Yes. The, the Boy yes. Scouts. I don't yeah, know the what Boy Scouts they do, do here, but uh, it's absolutely 
going on in Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, where there's a hunting culture. And these kids start hunting when they're 10 years old. Well, and when we say, what can we do? We can talk to our school board about, you know, I mean, I have this big issue with our school board not having enough sex education, but I think we also need to have gun safety education too. That's something that we can do. You know, and that's not political, right? That is community concern. Boy Scouts, I thought it was right. Boy Scouts are not really. ROTC. Mm hmm. Well, that's who, yeah, that's really. So then what do you say to the responsible gun owners who are uh, paranoid as well about this issue too? Because uh, uh, it can go both ways yes. depending who you're talking with. So what can be the narrative for that perspective in terms of, hey, you know, I'm a responsible gun owner, everything's I'm by the wall. Yeah, I would say can be, thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, you know, I think that though they can, it, it, as, as responsible gun over, owners, maybe they should push back against the NRA okay. on taking okay. these positions, trying to back it up to what it used to be, instead of being, you know, for um, open carry for assault weapons and so on. Randy, yes, can no. I say one thing more? I talk no, too much, I'm sorry. No, but ahead. thank you for your effort putting into this. This took oh. a great deal of effort and a great deal of thought, and I thank you very much yes. for doing it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I would like to reiterate um, a thank you to Randy for um, accepting the invitation. Um, he told me years ago, I will teach pastor if you give me enough time. And um, I am grateful that um, we wanted to do this um, during the month of October because this is the Presbyterian Church USA Peace and Global Witness Month. You've probably noticed, it, noticed that every single week we are saying the prayer of St. Francis. Um, and so I am thankful that you accepted this invitation during Peace and Global Witness. I'm thankful to the Mission Committee for um, being part of this conversation. As I'm looking through this statement that's been made by the PCUSA, there are steps of things that we can do um, beyond beginning the conversation. So we've done that. And um, like I said, during the week, this week, and then next week on Sunday, um, there will be articles from this issue of the Outlook and the, entire, the entirety of the Outlook if you would like to do some extra reading. Um, but right now, I'd like to suggest that we all go out into the world um, with grace and peace. Yes, Jose. Okay, one more thing here. Yes. If uh, you would like to help in some way with this initiative, uh, we are still collecting money for the Peace and Global Witness Offering. Yes. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, I believe we have 25% of that offering stays with us yes. uh, so that we can possibly discern new ministries uh, for peacemaking and, and uh, possibly education and more uh, the things to continue our, our commitment towards uh, peacemaking, which has been more than 40 years now yes. uh, as a denomination. So to, uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions, feel free to come to us, the mission committee, and we'll be happy to share that along. Yes, many of you might know that Jose is um, our mission committee chair, and um, I was really appreciative that in our last mission committee meeting on Friday, he made a point to say, hey, after we have this conversation about gun violence, um, we have a chance to use some of the funds that come for the Peace and Global Witness offering locally, and we can make a difference locally. Um, so I think that'll be a, a neat way, as, you, as Janice asked, what can we do next? Mm -hmm. So, thank it's you. Being is still being it yes. is still being collected, yes. Quick question, does anybody know uh, what are the laws and rules about shooting around the house? Uh, is it considered one part of town and another part of the country? Um, I know you're not supposed to shoot a bullet over property lines, but if your house is only have an acre, 
I don't know what local laws are about guns. I don't. <laughs> yeah, where we lived in Applewood, there was a lot of hunting, um, so we stayed out of people's backyards. a lot that I don't know. Um, probably a lot that we all don't know. Fort County Sheriff about shooting in subdivisions. I live in one of those and there are people that do shoot in there. Whether or not they're breaking the law, I don't know, but they've got the answer for you. Okay. <laughs> well, please continue the conversation. I know there's some more food left. The mission committee really treated us well. I could smell the food while we were worshiping. That's why it was great. So, and thank you, Riley, for videoing. We're glad for all of those who are joining us um, now or later. Antoinette. 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 Oh my goodness. Well, you had started it. And Antoinette, thank you.